Hi, everybody. Welcome. So uh, let's go ahead again and, and welcome everybody that's here so far to our Kickstarter Presents webinar series. We have a very exciting webinar for you today. You know, uh, we we have uh, Sabrina from the media who is going to be presenting to us on a compliance one. 101, uh, you know, and it's all about medical device development process and how to approach compliance in in research and development, which is, is fantastic. And uh, for those of you who don't know the media, it's a medical device manufacturing company that provides solutions to accelerate uh, development times for medical technologies. Uh, they also provide framework processes and tools, uh, as well as knowledge and connections to go from your average prototype uh, to market uh, a, and traditional high-tech and, and robotic, also medical devices. Uh, with us today presenting on, on our Pre-Compliance 101 seminar is, is, is Sabrina. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, we have Sabrina Varinelli and you know, she has a lot of experience in, in the field. She is a robotics engineer that specializes in medical uh, and surgical robotic systems. Her interdisciplinary background uh, includes expertise in engineering as well as regulatory and medical device development. Um, uh, she holds uh, not just one, but dual undergraduate degrees in robotics and mechanical engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, as well as a dual master in a robotics engineering and automatic production systems through the European Master on Advanced Robotic Programs. Yeah. Uh, before she moved into this specializing in the medical space, you know, she worked on systems uh, uh, in defense, oil and gas industries, uh, as well as a lot of uh, robotics projects, like from exoskeletons and uh, minimally invasive surgical systems. Yeah. Uh, uh, her experience in medical systems led her to the media, uh, and now she's helping bring new products to, to the market. So uh, uh, Sabrina, welcome, and I will let uh, you go ahead with the presentation. Awesome, thanks so much for the intro. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sabrina, and today we're going to be talking about how you can make sense of the medical device development process. It's a really hard process to go through, um, but there are things you can do now while you're in R&D, while you're in your earliest stage that are going to make your life a lot easier. And so I want to kind of give you practical advice today on what those steps are that you can take um, to facilitate this process of bringing your product to market. Let's see. So we got a nice intro um, about what Nemedio is, um, but we're essentially a compliant engineering platform. So we build tools and provide services to help companies bring their products to market quickly and more efficiently. Um, and so our tools range from compliance tools, um, which you know are like your quality management system types of things, to developer tools, which are actually um, advanced software systems that help you not have to write all of your software from scratch. We also provide services to help um, guide companies throughout this entire process. As you probably are all well aware, um, commercializing a new med device is ridiculously slow, it's expensive, and it's hard. And on average, you know, it takes uh, six and a half years and $31 million to get your product to market. Um, so if you're building, you know, a pretty, like an advanced electronic um, software-based system. And part of the reason and the underlying philosophy of around what Nemedio does and the tools that we provide is that we believe that this process is needlessly expensive and complicated. We think it can be made much more easy and much more accessible by companies doing things early on in their life cycles to help them along with this process. So this is what we're gonna be going over today. Um, when you guys think about the biggest challenges in what you're building, um, it's probably not the engineering. You probably have the engineering covered or you know, it's hard, but you can stay up all night and, and work on the stuff in the lab in order to, to make your product. The biggest challenge you probably think of um, is the compliance and the regulations. So when I start this talk, I like to start out by, you know, just asking the critical question, why do we have to do all of this? Why does compliance matter? Why do we have to go through all this red tape? Why do we have to worry about all this documentation while we're building our products? And at the end of the day, um, the reason for, you know, FDA's existence and all of these regs and why they exist is for consumer protection. Um, you don't want a company going and advertising a product that they're building that doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And I have you know, a fun little snippet over here of a um, uh, ad from a 1918 newspaper for snake oil. And the way that they market this snake oil is they say it acts upon pain as water acts upon fire. It puts it out completely and permanently. So this you know, Clark Stanley company is making a claim about their snake oil lintment um, saying that you know, it puts out your pain completely and permanently. If the FDA existed back then, 
this company would have had to, you know, provide clinical evidence that their snake oil actually put out pain, that it, you know, they'd have to do some clinical studies to test this. They'd have to show data showing that the ingredients that they're putting in the snake oil are safe. It's not some, you know, poisonous berry or poisonous leaf that they're putting in here. So the idea is that the FDA and all these regulations that you follow are preventing companies from essentially selling snake oil. They're preventing companies from making false claims about what their products can do so that at the end of the day, a patient or a consumer using your medical device is using a safe product that does what they're expecting it to do. So this is kind of the underlying philosophy around what we're doing here. So what usually happens during the med device development process and what we're trying to avoid is if you think of you know, the med device development process as a life cycle, you start with your proof of concept, you move into prototype, you're ready for a clinical study, you do some stuff, you get clearance, you start selling product. Think of that as your, you know, your continuum of time. What usually ends up happening is your engineering and product development is all you focus on during your earliest stage, during your proof of concept, during your prototype, you're you know, heads down, you're only thinking about product. You're like, we can worry about the compliance stuff later. At a certain point, you're like, okay, time to do a clinical study. Let me do, you know, let's do a porcine lab. Let's do a cadaver lab. Let's do some testing on this product. And you, you know, you call up a regulatory or quality consultant. You say, okay, hey, we're ready for compliance. What do we do next? So that we can test our product and start submitting stuff to the FDA. That consultant will likely take a look at all this work you've done. And they will say, well, you're missing all these regulatory standards. Your product needs to, you know, meet this electrical safety testing. You need to do all this stuff that you forgot about. Oh, by the way, you need to do risk management. And, you know, there's these five things that can go wrong with your device. You need to re-engineer it so it can, you know, be more safe. What ends up happening is they give you a laundry list of stuff to do. You spend another, you know, two to three years redoing a lot of the work that you probably could have done back in this time period. Now through a regulatory lens with all of these extra requirements that you now have to do. This is where companies usually run out of cash because you know you have a set amount of, of money, you probably spent it all over here, didn't not realizing that you had to do all this compliance stuff before you could, you know, do your, your clinical testing. Companies usually run out of cash. And the reason why people why, why these companies run out of cash is because you're not considering compliance from the beginning of your life cycle. And that's what we're here to talk about today. What are the activities that you as a company can do? during your earliest stages of your, soft, of your product development life cycle. That will enable you to have a very smooth transition to compliant activities. So it's not this very just disjointed thing where you're engineer, 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 compliance, and then you know, redo all this work. Um, so Nemedio calls these activities pre-compliance activities or the activities that you do before you're ready for compliance, hence the word pre-compliance. And um, what we're gonna go through today are, you know, what are these activities in detail? how you can do the, how, and how you can do them in order to set yourself up for success. So pre-compliance 101. This diagram that I have here is something that I want all of you to, you know, put into your brains. You're gonna get copies of these slides after, but you know, if you wanna screenshot it, I wouldn't be opposed. Um, we call this diagram um, the Nemedio method for pre-compliance. We also have a very large, you know, compliance version of this diagram that has, you know, like 150 boxes. This is the stuff that you should be concerned about right now during your earliest stages of pre-compliance. So one of the first things you should be, and we're going to go through each one of these in detail. One of the first things that you should be concerned about is your regulatory strategy plan. So this is a planning document that describes your overall path towards approval. It includes things like the device classification, which we'll talk more about, what type of approval pathway are you getting? Your 510K, de novo, that type of stuff. Um, it also helps outline the relevant standards, guidance documents, and regs that you need to comply with. So this is the very important list that makes it so that you don't have to re-engineer your product because you forgot to comply with some electrical safety standard or you know, something like that. It also helps you outline when you're going to be meeting with the FDA and what types of content you'll be covering when you meet with the FDA. We're going to talk more about this at the end of the presentation because all of the stuff that we're talking about that we're doing during pre-compliance, the end result is for you to get to a milestone called a pre-submission meeting with the FDA, where you actually show the FDA your plans and the FDA looks at your plans and said, yes, we agree with your plans. You're on the right track. This is a very strong signal if you're you know, a company that's doing fundraising, for example, 
this is a super strong signal to send to your potential investors that you actually know what you're doing and you have everything under control from a regulatory and compliance perspective. So again, the regulatory strategy plan is the first activity. While the rest of the activities we you know, recommend you do a lot of the heavy lifting on your own, this is one activity where we highly recommend you involve um, you know, an experienced regulatory consultant to help you put this plan together. So um, diving a little bit more into a couple of ideas in the regulatory strategy plan. One of the most critical things you may have heard of a lot um, is this concept of device classification or device classes. So FDA divides products um, based on their risk level. So you may have heard, you know, class one, two, and three. And depending on the class that you are, you have to put a certain amount of extra effort into the test data that you provide to FDA in order to show that a device is safe and effective. So for example, if you're a class one device, you're, you know, you're lower risk, class two devices are moderate risk, class three devices are high risk. And most devices end up being class two, moderate to high risk. Um, but depending on what classification you are, there are some minimum requirements for um, uh, study submission and data submission that you have to do in order to, to get your device cleared. Um, the device classification also informs what types of regulations you need to follow from a quality system perspective. And it also helps inform you know, the types of standards you should be following as you're doing your, um, your engineering activities. Um, how do you determine your device class? This is where you know, you can go and try to do some research to try to figure this out, but this is, an, this is an area where it's kind of so important that we really just recommend you getting a expert person to come in and work with your team to put this together during the regulatory strategy plan. But again, it's all about that risk, you know, to quote Megan Trainer. I'm sure she said that in her song. Um, so another big part of the regulatory strategy plan is to determine your regulatory pathway. You may have also heard this referred to as the pre-market submission for your product. Um, again, going back to the snake oil, um, FDA exists because, you know, you have to build products that are safe and that work. So safe, safety and efficacy is like, are the two most important buzzwords for FDA. Um, you have to build a, a product that works for the thing that you're saying it works for and a product that is safe for, you know, it's not going to poison people or, or hurt them as they're using it. So there are three ways to submit your data to the FDA and they kind of are titled according to the regulation and the law that they fall under. Um, the first one and the most common one is called a 510K. And this is a little topic that kind of annoys me when people say like, oh, I got 510K approval. You actually get 510K clearance, not approval. Um, PMA is where you get approval and you know you get a grant from a de novo, but that's a little bit of a expert level tip there. Um, so when you get a 510K, you're getting a 510K clearance. And what the underlying idea behind a 510K clearance is that you are de demonstrating that your device is at least as safe and effective as another device that exists on the market. So you may have heard the word predicate device thrown around. Um, a predicate device is a device that has a similar um, intended use that your product has, and you use it as the benchmark for doing your clinical and safety testing. Um, and you, know, you select predicates, not just based on the technology, but on the way that the technology is used in order to um, perform the intended use. Selection of your predicate device is also something, you know, all the stuff we're talking about at the beginning, is the stuff that we really do recommend you get assistance with. Whereas the stuff we're gonna cover later on is stuff that you can really be a little bit more hands-on as an early stage company with um, less medical device experience. Um, one of the other, well, we'll come back to this actually. So the next, um, the next type, so the 510K is the easiest one to get um, from a documentation perspective. One of the other regulatory pathways that's a little bit more difficult is this pathway called de novo and you're granted a de novo. Um, and de novos are applicable for low to moderate risk devices, similar to, to 510K. Um, more clinical data is required than for a 510K submission. The reason behind this is because there's no predicate device that currently exists that you can compare your product to to make your um, application to the FDA much more straightforward. So if there is no product on the market that, um, you know, is a predicate for your product, you will have to go with the de novo. The difference in timing and um, you know, cost to get a 510K product to the market versus a de novo product is very significant. 
And it's significantly easier to get a 510K. It's significantly cheaper to get a 510K out of a company than a de novo or a PMA. And so as you can imagine, not knowing this information before you go out to fundraise is kind of you know, a red flag. If you don't know how much clinical data you need to submit because you don't know if you're 510K or de novo, it's kind of a, a big deal from, from a perspective of planning out your business. So this is why we say it's absolutely critical. Do your regulatory strategy plan very early. And then the reason behind this pre-submission meeting, this meeting with the FDA that we're going to talk about later, is FDA will look at your argument as to why you're a 510K versus the de novo. And they'll be able to say, yes, we agree with you, or no, we think you're a de novo. And you know, then you have to plan ahead accordingly for that. Um, the third type uh, of, of major regulatory pathway for devices is called a PMA. And this is what's used for high-risk devices. So, you know, a lot of clinical data is required for this, um, you know, more than the de novo because it's a higher risk device, but, you know, similar style. And one of the, also the critical things between, the critical differences between these three regulatory pathways has to do with when your manufacturing facility and your company is inspected by the FDA. You hear all these things, especially in the news right now with COVID, where you know, the FDA auditor showed up to a plant and found all these problems and they had to throw away a bunch of vaccines because they found problems. This process is called an FDA inspection or an FDA audit. And when you're getting a 510K, you are allowed to have your facility inspected after you start selling your product. If you're getting a de novo or a PMA, you must have your facility inspected before you can start selling your product. So as you can you know, maybe extrapolate from this, when it comes to a timeline perspective of how you're planning out your business and your timelines, it's very critical to know this nation up front because the inspection process takes a long time. And you know, even the submission process takes a long time. So from the day that you submit your application, FDA gives you three 90 day review cycles. So it could take up to three quarters of time before you're allowed to sell your product if you're a 510K because you can get your inspection after the clearance. Um, in order to get your you know, de novo or your PMA, you have to be inspected before the clearance. So that you know, three quarters of time could drag on to four quarters, could drag on to five, five quarters, depending on how busy FDA is. That's a whole entire year of runway that you potentially have to plan for if you're you know, raising venture capital money to, to fund your project um, where you're not selling product. So again, understanding this and act, being able to act accordingly at the beginning of your project is very important for planning out your you know, go to market trajectory as a business. So do not neglect your regulatory strategy plan. Also, don't try to do it on your own. This is not something you wanna mess up because it's kind of the foundation for everything else. So that's your regulatory strategy plan. It kind of sets the stage for all the compliance activities you'll be doing in the future. Next, we're gonna talk about the indications for use. So you've been hearing me talk a little bit about, you know, how a product must be safe and effective for its intended use or its indications for use. This is the thing that you say your device is used for. This is the thing that FDA is granting you a pre-market notification or that clearance or that approval. They're giving you permission to go and you know, have a commercial or advertise your product to do a particular thing. Um, and the indication for use is kind of the other flip side of this. It's what circumstances your product is used in. These statements, you know, they get pretty detailed, but roughly, you as a company right now can probably sit down and write, you know, my device is intended for use by um, patients with colon cancer um, in order to treat, you know, or remove their, the, the cancer portion of their colon. Um, this device is indicated for use in the treatment of colon cancer and shall not be used by patients with uh, stage four cancer. That is an example of a contraindication, which is circumstances your product may not be used in. So you not only need to say when your, your product can be used, but when it shouldn't be used. This is when you hear like at the end of the drug commercials, they say this product should only be used in adults aged 18 to 65. It shall not be used by pregnant or nursing mothers. This is um, the, you know, the indication for use statement with the contraindications included. And again, you as a company at your early stage, you had an idea to build this product. You know why you're building this product. You don't need to write it perfectly, but if you have you know, a Google Doc or you know, if you're using the Nemedio system, if you go into the system and write out your indications for use, this is a really big step in getting the initial set of documentation that you need so that you can um, you know, be on the right path for transitioning to full compliance. So the next thing we're gonna talk about are um, 
the device description and the system architecture. So these are two other documents that you as a company could sit down and write today if you're you know, doing R&D on a product. This is a very easy document to get a first draft of. It's a harder document to get you know, the final draft that you're gonna actually submit to the FDA. Um, you essentially sit and you, you know, describe what your device does and you diagram its architecture. You should not forget about software while you're doing this. Software is a part of your device. Um, just as a side note, firmware is also considered software from FDA's perspective. Um, but you know, the way to write this out might be, uh, my device is, it has three main systems. Part A is responsible for doing X, Y, Z. Part B does this, part C does this. Describe how they connect to each other. Describe um, you know, how you package it, what somebody does to open it, how it's sterilized. Um, this is where you as you know, the engineering team can go in and data dump all of the stuff that you know about what you're building. This will eventually turn into a formal document that you use to communicate with FDA during the pre-submission meeting and also during your you know, final submission to them. But again, you're an engineering team doing R&D. You know how to write these documents. You don't need an expensive consultant to come in and write these for you for the first draft. You do want to hire them later to um, you know, review stuff for you. So the next two chunks we're going to talk about are user needs and requirements. So earlier, when I mentioned this concept of pre-compliance, the underlying goal behind pre-compliance is essentially to get your engineers the full list of requirements they need to build to so they don't have to re-engineer the product. There's a lot of different ways you get requirements. One of the ways is you know, how you know what you're, what you're building at the moment, you can kind of feed into your requirements. Um, another way in the regulatory strategy, and we've talked about these standards that like, you know, electrical safety standards that you have to follow, these also feed into your requirements. The biggest thing that feeds into your requirements um, are user needs and risks. So the first one we're gonna talk about are user needs. So user needs are essentially, you take a list, you take a look at your intended use, you take a look at the stakeholders who are going to be using your product. And from a clinical perspective, you sit and you document the user stories as a user, and then in your head, you can say, in order to perform the device's intended use, I need the device to X, Y, Z. As a user, in order to perform you know, colon resection surgery with my surgical robot, I need the device to be able to access you know, the um, uh, rightmost portion of the bowel so I can reach the sigmoid colon. As a user, I need the device to um, be able to take inputs from a doctor um, so as to turn on cautery at the right time to cauterize the blood vessels. As the user, I need the device to have a display where I can see the camera view as I'm performing the surgery remotely as the surgeon. This is where you write out all of these things. Um, one important thing is that you have to consider users as being anybody involved in the use of your device. So if it's you know, wearable and a patient wears it, also consider maybe their caregiver is the one putting it on. Look at the usage of your product from all these perspectives and um, essentially, you know, put yourself in their shoes, write out what they need the product to do. This is something that, you know, you probably have clinicians on your team. The engineers can probably do this. You as a team know what you're building, write it down. This is the most important part, write it down because it'll save you later and it will allow us to approach things methodically so that we can make sure that you're not forgetting any requirements when you're engineering your device. It will make it so that you avoid having to re-engineer your device once the compliance stuff gets looked at, which will then stop you from you know, running out of money too early and having your company shut down. So those are the user needs. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about the requirements. So the requirements are you know, what you as an engineering team doing R&D would expect to see. In order to meet the user's needs, what are the characteristics that your device must have? What are you actually building? And these are written in a very straightforward way. The product shall X, Y, Z. The surgical robot shall have a heads up display um, that is you know, 16 inches long and eight inches high. And these should be specific. You know, Like I included dimensions there, that was intentional. The product shall um, you know, have the ability to deliver cautery energy to a blood vessel at a range of you know, whatever cautery is measured in, heat or whatever, um, X number of joules of heat. The product shall have foot pedals that allow me to turn the cautery off and on. The product shall you know, have a blue housing. You, know, you can even get into these more marketing related requirements 
when you're here. Again, requirements are what your engineers are actually working on during R&D. If they don't have a full set, and if they don't know the full set of things that they're building to, they're gonna build the wrong product, you have to redo your work. This is what we're trying to avoid. So the objective here is to get as many inputs into your requirements as you possibly can so that you're building the right product the first time and not having to go back. The next chunk of stuff that feeds into requirements um, is this chunk of stuff related to risk management. So risk management is a massive um, undertaking for a med device company. Um, there is a whole standard called ISO 14971. If you're looking for some you know, bedtime reading to maybe put you to sleep, um, I recommend reading ISO 14971. Um, it's very good, but it's very dense. And it describes a systematic methodology that med tech companies should follow for analyzing, for, for determining, analyzing, and mitigating risk in your medical device. So I'm gonna give you a little preview of what you have to do from a you know, more detailed perspective, what's gonna happen later. And then we're gonna talk about what are the things you can do early on to make this job of doing full-blown risk management according to 14971 a lot easier when you're ready for it. So let's think about a radiator. I'm based in New York. I know most of you are not based in New York, um, but I'm based in New York and there are a lot of apartments here that still have radiators. And you know they're just kind of sitting in people's living rooms. The harm associated with a radiator is that somebody can get burned on it, right? That is the bad thing that can happen to a person when a radiator is around. But a radiator is just kind of over there sitting in the corner, right? So it's in and of itself, it's a hazard. It's just sitting there. Or you can think of like, you know, if, um, if you've seen, you know, those wet floor signs when somebody mops, it says like hazard, wet floor. Just because a hazard exists doesn't mean that the bad thing is actually happening to a person, but the hazard does exist. And you know it needs to be acknowledged. It has a likelihood of existing as well. How likely is it that this, you know, that the radiator fins are exposed or that the wet floor is happening? In order for a hazard to actually, you know, hurt somebody and cause harm, some sequence of events must occur. A hazardous situation must arise. In the case of the radiator, somebody has to touch the exposed fins. Um, there's a probability that somebody is going to touch these exposed fins. So we now have like two probability or likelihood levels here that we're working with. Um, in the case of the wet floor, let's say you are mopping the floor near the bathroom of your office building. A lot of people go to the bathroom, the likelihood that someone's going to slip and fall and that a hazard will become a hazardous situation and actually cause harm to somebody is higher then maybe the mopped floor on the way to CEO's office. Maybe not a lot of people go talk to the CEO. So what we're seeing here is that there's probability associated with the hazard and hazardous situation. How likely is it that this bad thing happens? When we look at the harm, the way that we look at the harm from a numeric or kind of a qualitative perspective is the, um, the aspect of how severe the harm is. You know, a bruise is less severe because it heals faster than you know, a laceration. Um, a first degree burn is less severe than a third degree burn. So we are now qualitatively looking at severity levels of harm and probability levels of that harm occurring to a patient. From an academic perspective, um, we will you know, do the exercise and do the work of assessing the risk. From a perspective of you know, normal everyday engineers, you already knew that there was a risk here. You could have said it, you know, burn due to touching the exposed radiator pins. Somebody getting a bruise because they slipped on the floor and fell. It's very easy for engineering teams to sit out and write all the risks associated with their device. It's a little bit harder to do all of this back analysis to figure out severity and probability so that you can comply with 14971. At your earliest stage, what we ask companies to do is because you know your good engineers are already sitting there and thinking about risks to their product. We ask that you write them down um, and we call this a risk note. So this risk note will turn into a full-blown full system hazard risk analysis later on. But at this phase of R&D that you're in, even just keeping like a running tally of the risks that your product has while you think of them is you know, one of the easiest ways you can help yourself later on in this process. Because 
what needs to happen is for every risk that exists, you must come up with a mitigation. A risk mitigation makes it so that the risk is less. In the case of you know, the radiator, I could put a cover on the radiator so that you know, the severity of a burn is less because it's less hot. Um, in the case of the wet floor, you know, people put signs up. Um, that is a mitigation. It's not very effective, right? A sign is less effective than if you put like an actual fence around. So mitigations have varying levels of effectiveness. And what they do is from an academic perspective, they reduce the harm or they reduce the probability that the bad thing will happen, thereby reducing the overall risk. So, you know, when we do full blown 14971 analysis, what we'll do is we'll go through and we will assign qualitative numeric values to all of these to ensure that all risks have been mitigated properly. But while you're in R&D, you have good engineers on your team. They're already thinking about the risk. And you know, every engineer has looked at something they're designing in CAD or some code that they're doing and said, well, if this breaks, something bad's gonna happen. So I'm gonna like, you know, make this piece thicker or I'm gonna add this um, error message to my code or I'm gonna you know, add this exception. You're already doing that while you're doing R&D. If you write those things down in a, in, like, in a way that links and link them together and kind of document this properly, you are saving yourself tons of work later on when you go to do full-blown 14971 analysis. Um, one of the other things we suggest to that you do is there's a set of questions that we recommend companies answer at the beginning of their R&D effort that will help them start thinking about what the risks are because at the end of the day, all of these mitigations need to turn into requirements and your product must then be built to meet them. So, you know, let's say you are building a radiator, you didn't put the radiator cover on, you're, you're ready to do your clinical study and then, you know, your risk analysis consultant comes in and says, you guys have this massive risk here that you didn't mitigate, go back and fix the product to have this risk or to, to mitigate this risk so that it's safe. You now have to re-engineer your work. So knowing these upfront help you with your R&D efforts because it allows you to build the right product the first time, which is our goal here. Again, you're not gonna catch everything by doing this on your own, but you're gonna catch a lot and it's going to you know, really help your chances of having a smooth transition to compliant operation later on. So the last piece of the puzzle here is this concept um, called test protocol notes. So you may have heard this phrase called VNV. VNV stands for verification and validation. When it comes to um, you know, testing your product, uh, these are the two types of tests that exist. Um, verification tests have to do more with the requirement side of things, they're more engineering related. And they basically answer the question, does the device do what I say it's going to do? Um, validation answers the question, does the device do what the user needs it to do? And in there, these tests are a little bit more clinical related. So when you hear about like clinical studies, for example, those are most like, likely validation tests that you're doing on your product. Verification and validation tests are complicated to write in a way that FDA understands them. Um, and we don't recommend that you try to do these early on during R&D mode. What we recommend doing during pre-compliance is to basically take notes from the engineering tests that you use and the, the stuff that you're doing um, during your R&D activities, take notes and link them back to your requirements and user needs, because this will make, you know, this will make it a lot easier later on when you're ready to write your full-blown protocols to have something to work with. So you're not starting from scratch and having to remember everything. So the underlying idea behind everything we just talked about. Again, I've said this like 50 times, but it, it's worth repeating. You wanna build the right product the first time. You don't wanna to have to do 30 million redesigns of your entire product. Iterative work is definitely something you need to do, but you know, a complete overhaul because you forgot some mitigations and standards is unacceptable because you, know, because you should be thinking about this stuff early on. One of the things you're required to do um, when you submit your FDA documentation is build this thing called a trace matrix. So a trace matrix, essentially all of these like solid lines that I've drawn here, it basically shows the relationship of how you got the information. So, you know, for every user need that exists, you have to show that you're tracing it to a requirement that allows you to meet that user need. For every mitigation that exists, you should be showing a requirement that demonstrates, you know, how you're actually engineering the product to mitigate that, that mitigation. 
or to implement that mitigation. For every risk that you have, you know, what is the mitigation related to it? Um, similarly, with user needs and requirements, you're required to show that you have a test for every single one of them. You know, one test can cover, you know, 10 requirements in one shot, but at the end of the day, this concept of traceability, showing these relationships and um, ensuring that you have full trace coverage is one of, the, one of the really big important things for your final submission. And again, starting this work early can only help you in this process because it allows you to do this stuff as you're engineering your device and not have to sit there later on while a regulatory consultant sits across the room for you and tries to interview you to try to reconstruct all of this stuff later. This not only sets you up for success from a compliance perspective, but it allows you to build the product right the first time. So we just did all this work. And before I mentioned that the end result of all this work is we recommend that you meet with the FDA during what's called the pre-submission meeting. We at Nemedio very strongly recommend you meet with the FDA. It's not required. In fact, some people are like, oh no, don't meet with the FDA because if you don't meet with them, then you know, they can't tell you to do stuff, which is completely wrong. Um, the idea behind this meeting with the FDA is to confirm your strategy and especially your testing plan with them. So you're not only confirming, you know, your device classification and whether or not you're a 510K or a de novo, which has massive impact on how you as a company raise money. Um, you're also getting FDA to look at, here's my plan to do clinical testing and here's my plan to do engineering testing on my product to make sure that it's, that it's right. And you don't need a full protocol to start your talks with the FDA. Having these test protocol notes and showing that they are related to your user needs and your requirements is you know, a good enough start for initiating the conversation. They can start providing feedback on this and it becomes an open and interactive dialogue with the FDA. Additionally, one of the most important things is you know, FDA is really concerned about safety. We wanna know your, your product is safe. Showing them this initial risk assessment, they can go in and they can point out some of the things that they are concerned with from a risk perspective so that you can make sure you're taking care of them before you submit your final submission. So you know, the idea here is that FDA is kind of giving you a nod. They're not saying, you know, for sure we'll accept your device, but they're, they're giving you the next best thing. They're basically saying, we agree with your plan and we think that you're on the right track and that if you keep going down this track, we'll be able to clear your device. Um, it's also really interesting that usually the people that are grouped together um, from the FDA to do your pre-submission meeting are usually the same people who will be actually reading your final submission for the device. So it's a really good opportunity to get FaceTime with these people, to build up the relationship with them. They'll give you their business cards at the end. You can get their email address and like, you know, talk to the people who are going to be approving your product or clearing your product. It's almost like cheating, right? <laughs> that you get access to the referee who's gonna be you know, reviewing your game. Um, so this is something that's really important. So a little note on timelines, everything in FDA land takes a long time to do. Um, I talked a little bit about before about how when you submit your full submission, it's three 90 day review cycles. It's like three quarters where they're potentially reviewing your device. Um, it's a similar, you know, three month timeline for your pre-submission meeting. So what will happen and, you know, from an, a perspective of, you know, a key takeaway of what you should do right after this, I recommend, you know, taking this diagram, doing all of these activities. And at the end of this, you'll now have a package of information that you can submit to FDA. They will then, you know, acknowledge the receipt of it. They'll start looking at it. This will take anywhere from 60 to 90 days for them to look at it. They'll, during this time, they'll also schedule the meeting with you. They'll also be sending you notes and questions so that there's some back and forth beforehand. You'll actually have the one hour meeting. You know, back in the day, we used to do these at FDA's headquarters where we recommend having FaceTime with these people and actually going there to DC. Um, and at the end of it, you submit what are called meeting minutes, which is a formal record of all the stuff you talked about and the agreements that you came to about what your plan is and how it should be modified. So this is kind of a, a long three month process, but from a macro perspective of company planning, we recommend that if you're going for you know, a series A or a seed round of funding, that you are doing this process beforehand because being able to, you know, we're friends with investors and we have good relationships with investors who invest in med tech. And this is like the single thing that we, um, 
that, that they agree with us is the most effective way to convince them that you know what you're doing from a compliance perspective is that you've met with the FDA and had this pre-submission meeting. So it is something that we highly recommend. So um, thank you for you know, listening to all of this stuff on, on pre-compliance. Um, you know, we actually, this is part of what we do. We actually have a, uh, a new starter license that we um, are putting together that actually allows you to get started on all of these activities. It takes, you know, these same exact concepts. It has a bunch of places where you can document these things on your own. And then you can call us in for help on the things like the regulatory strategy plan. Um, if you're interested in working with us, um, we have a wait list for our new starter license and we'll send out this link. Um, we also are offering um, to members of the group um, some office hours where you can schedule some time to come and meet with us to ask us questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if there's anything that I don't get answered today for you, or if you have some more in-depth, you know, proprietary stuff you want to talk about, you can set up some office hours with us to get some insight into what you're building. Um, so thank you. And with that, we can open it up to some questions here. Well, thank you so much, Rina. That was, that was uh, great. Thank and, you. Yeah. Again, remember, uh, everybody here in the audience, please go ahead. You can submit questions through, through the chat room or uh, just you know, uh, raise your hand and um, we can ask the question directly that way. I uh, just did to, to get us started. Obviously, you, you, you touched a lot on, on, on the different classes, you know, uh, you know, but obviously, uh, when you're working with, with founders and they're trying to kind of, you know, um, you, know, you do one approach or the other, you know, obviously, your recommendation is to, to kind of go and talk to, 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 to the experts, but um, how and when you should approach if it's you know if they have already a clear idea whether it's a class one or class two mm -hmm. uh, or other uh, class three device you know um you know you know how should they approach each of this in, in the product development timeline you know is it different at all if, if it falls within one of these classes yeah um, yeah it is it is massively different and so that's why you know that's something that i put oops i lost my presentation that's something <laughs> that i put way at the beginning because it's you know one of the most critical things to figure out because it does have those timeline impacts so it impacts in two ways um the first way that it has an impact is the amount of clinical data that you have to submit in order to get your device you know in order for fda to clear your device or approve your device and so when i say amount of data what that really means is how much testing you need to do so if you're doing a clinical study um, maybe if you're a class two device and you're a 510K, you might be able to get away with a, you know, maybe you're doing a porcine study. Um, you can do like a five pig study versus, you know, a 50 person clinical study. So if you don't know your device class, you don't know your regulatory pathway. If you don't know your regulatory pathway, you don't know how much data you need to submit. You don't know to what extent FDA is going to require that you test your product. You know, there's a massive time and cost difference between five pigs and 50 people when you're doing your clinical testing. And so knowing that as early as possible um, is, is pretty critical. So I think, and it, I guess, I think also like the crux of what you're asking is probably like when more globally should you start any of these things? These activities should be started as soon as you're like doing prototyping. If you have like a clear idea of, you know, I'm trying to build a surgical device and I have like a rough prototype or I'm in kind of like early, like you have CAD designs, maybe you haven't built it physically, but if you could sit and describe to me in a device description what you're building, you're ready to start doing some of these activities and, you know, de-risking your process. Um, and so, you know, to, to go back to the original question, knowing your device class feeds into this, feeds into how long it's going to take, feeds into, you know, how much testing you need to do. And then there is this matter of the inspection time. Inspection time is kind of a wild card in terms of getting your product to market. So let's say you raise $10 million. You think that $10 million gets you through FDA submission. If you are inspection post clear or pre-clearance, you know, you need to add on another $2 million to pay all of your people while FDA is reviewing your submission. You also have to be planning from a roadmap perspective. What is your team doing during that time? Are you preparing your marketing materials? Are you working on rev two of your product? What are you doing while you wait for this pre-clearance and for your device to be cleared um, or approved? So, you know, it has it has kind of massive implications down the line. So finding out as soon as possible is is absolutely critical. 
And uh, what can you tell us about predicate devices? You know, uh, you know, what is the process for that? Do you need to you know, demonstrate mm -hmm. equivalence between the two? You know? Yeah. Anything that you can share would be very useful. Thanks. Yeah. And so this is actually one of the things that if you're planning to go for a 510K, which you should try for, even if you're borderline, you should always try for a 510K, have the pre-sub meeting. And then, you know, if FDA kicks you up to de novo, then yes, that happened, but at least you tried to get the easier one. Um, so what you should be doing is you should be finding your predicate. So this requires a predicate search and predicate searches are, you know, this is something that again, you want an expert to do. I mentioned before device predicates, you know, we as engineers might think of a device predicate as like, you know, I'm building a surgical robot. Another surgical robot is my device predicate. That's the obvious thing. Not true. Device predicates are more based on the indicated use and the intentions or the, the, the indications for use and the intended use than they are on the actual technology. The original Da Vinci surgical robot was not granted a de novo. It was granted a 510K and its predicate device was a laparoscopic manual tool because the intended use is to perform, you know, um, hysterectomies using lapar laparoscopy. Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're, it's not a technological comparison. It's a functionality like comparison. So doing this analysis, you actually, you know, from a physical perspective, you sit and you make a table and there are tools like Medio that help you do this process easier, but you literally go through and you say, here are the characteristics of my device. Here are the characteristics of the product device. Here's how we're similar. Here's how we're different. And even though we're different, here's the test. This goes back to traceability. You want to like trace all this through. Here's how we're different. Here's the test that shows that even though we're different, we're still safe. And it's this logical argument that you're presenting to FDA in order to do your 510K um, submission. And, you know, from a physical perspective, you can imagine it as like, you know, a table where you're tracing and storing all this information. Does that answer the question? No, yeah, thank you. I think we have a question in the chat. Let's look at it here. Oh no, okay, never mind. Asking for more questions. <laughs> I, I guess another question while we're waiting from the audience too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, obviously you touched up, uh, on, on, on this inspection pre-clearance and post-clearance and, and um, uh, from the different, you know, uh, uh, different submissions, you know, uh, you know Obviously, the class three here uh, require probably the most uh, inspections, and, and mm -hmm. uh, many of the startups that we work with will maybe work with manufacturers that already have you know some some of this. Can maybe can you talk about that? And maybe maybe yeah. is that a, is oh. that a way forward for small startup companies that you work with? Uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm gonna send you a white paper that we wrote on this topic um, to distribute to the to everybody here. I could talk for hours on this topic. <laughs> Most companies, you know, if you're spinning out of a tech transfer office or something like this, you are going to want to find what's called a contract manufacturer. Your contract manufacturer is going to be great. They're going to have a quality system. They're going to know what they're doing. Um, they're going to have, you know, everything well situated for you. You as a company, though, are still responsible for the finished product. Your, your supplier might have a quality system. They might be able to cover some of the regulations you still have to cover, you know, 70% of the stuff. You are allowed to delegate things to them. And yes, from a physical inspection point, they may actually go to your contract manufacturer's physical location, but you know, you're gonna want your quality person there to do the inspection with your manufacturer. Because at the end of the day, you are the one who's going to get the letter from the FDA saying you have to shut down operations. You're the one who's gonna have to process the recall. You are responsible for auditing your suppliers and making sure that they meet your standards as a company. They're basically an extension of you. It's like, you know, a subcontractor type of relationship. So, you know, we actually have a part two and a part three more advanced versions of this talk. Um, we go very in depth into supplier management. There's audits you have to do of your suppliers. Um, you have to do, you know, risk analysis. You have to figure out this thing called a quality agreement, which is, you know, when they send you documents, how you sign off on them and send them back to them. Um, it's a, it's definitely a lot easier. You should most like, you know, 90% of the time you should not be trying to stand up your own manufacturing facility for your med device. You should be using a contract manufacturer and taking advantage of their expertise, but that does not absolve you of doing all of this extra work to make sure that they're doing things right. Um, and so, you know, there's processes in place to do this. It's called supplier management, purchasing controls, 
um, you know, nonconformance reports, all these types of things. And so um, it's definitely makes your life easier, but there's just other challenges you have to deal with when using a contract manufacturer. And, and I guess, do you see any difference between, you know, I guess in choosing your manufacturer uh, mm -hmm. by if you're 510 or RPMA, uh, yeah, roads? Um, so at a minimum, so there's, you know, there's, there's quality certifications you can look at just like a stamp. So it's like, you probably shouldn't be considering any contract manufacturer that doesn't have 1345 if they're, you know, doing a lot of work for you. Um, you at least want 9,001, but you know, so, so the idea here is it's all risk-based. So based on how risky, what your supplier is supplying to you. So if they're putting together the entire product and, you know, they're receiving parts from all of your sub suppliers, like, you know, the PCB manufacturer is shipping a part to your contract manufacturer. Um, maybe the, uh, the plastics molding company is shipping a part to them. The CM is then the contract manufacturer is then putting this stuff all together sterilizing it, slapping a label on it and like shipping out. The extent to which they are involved in your process is how deeply you need to qualify them. Supplier qualification comes in a lot of layers. It's really around these concepts of doing audits and it's how deep of an audit you do. Um, you know, part two of this talk is actually setting up a quality management system for you as a company. Again, you can delegate some of those quality management activities to your supplier, um, but how much and how much you audit them and how deep you go when you look into their procedures, you know, it's going to be a lot more if your device is higher risk, just because, you know, you have to build a higher risk product. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a correlation there. We have a question from uh, Deanna. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's basically, it sounds like you have a perspective on the funding landscape. Uh, uh, obviously you yeah. mentioned about the VA pre-meeting as a key trigger, but are there any thoughts that you have on, on key funding milestones or investment trends? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts on this topic. Um, so, so I fundraise too for Nemedio. Like my, I, I definitely have gone through this. And you know, like I said, we have a lot of good relationships with with VCs. There are not, like you know, truth be told, there are not a lot of pre-seed and seed stage med tech firm funds out there. There, are, you know, there's more coming out, but there's not a lot of them to begin with. Um, what you'll see instead are these more deeper technology funds who are interested in med tech for whatever reason, because it somehow fits their thesis. Maybe the VC's portfolio thesis is not specifically med tech, but they're like, we really like, you know, um, consumer facing like wellness products and you're a med device and they're like, well, we'll look at you. The most important thing to assure these deep tech investors who are considering a med device is that you have all the scary stuff taken care of. You have all the compliance stuff under control, which is why the pre-sub meeting and you know, working with a trusted partner, you know, shameless, shameless sales pitch here, but working with a trusted partner like Medio goes a long way to making sure that your VCs feel comfortable that you as a group of engineers who have the, you know, the engineering expertise to put this product out, actually know what you're doing from a compliance perspective. Most of these VCs who are you know, deeper tech VCs, they don't, understand this stuff. And so you have to reassure them that you do. And this is why the pre-sub meeting is, is super important. So what I usually see as a trajectory um, is, you know, you have a tech transfer office, you know, they spin out the company. There's maybe a half a million funding, quarter of a million, like 250K, 100K in funding. You as a company want to take that money and go as far as you can to get you to the next funding milestone. This whole entire concept of what I've been, been like, you know, harping on this whole time is basically what we call MVP compliance. It's the thing that you should be doing alongside your engineering activities to get you to this point where you can now show it all to an investor and raise the next round of funding to get you to the next level. And being too one-sided on um, uh, engineering and not considering the regulatory stuff is the surest way that you're going to scare away one of these, you know, more technology focused investors from investing in your company. And those are the, the technology focused investors are likely who you're going to have to sell to because seed stage med tech is very rare. Usually it's like the big players like Orbi Med and Deerfield and NEA, who they want to invest in companies that already have you know, clearance or approval. Um, so seed stage is, is very hard. And the, the TLD here is seed stage med tech funding is very difficult. The way to do it is to reassure the 
technology investors who are not med tech specific that you have all the stuff under control. All of the stuff that I was just talking about gears you up to do that. And you know, the icing on the cake is actually having had that pre-sub meeting with FDA and then being able to show them that, you know, FDA nodded at your stuff. And you know, that's like super de-risked. That's like the easiest thing for them to, to say yes to at that point. That is great. I'm conscious of the time, uh, Sabrina, and uh, I think this has been very useful. I really want to encourage the audience to, to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to, to schedule office hours uh, with the media and talk about the process. Obviously, you know, um, you know, some great points here, things that you as a company can start doing even in the early stages, like user needs and, and, and indications for use regardless you know but you know really figuring out what that path uh, is, is is so important and so critical uh so so please encourage everybody to do that but do take advantage of of, of this office hours um yeah uh, here and and again um anything that we can do to support you with with getting your medical devices uh, yeah to to the market so thank you so much for for today's talk um and uh we'll be we recorded this meeting, so it'll be available for others as well to register for the webinar as well later. Um, and Sabrina, you you have your contact details as well um, it, there uh, for anybody who wants to to apply. How, how do they apply for the office hours? And yeah, so there's um, the uh, you can just send an email to info at Nemedio. I think what what we'll do after this is we'll send you a follow up email, uh, Maria, and then you can you know pass. It yeah, on well, to we'll forward it to to the participants yeah. into our network. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was fun. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.